it is time to start. The only person or people that I don't see here are Jerry and Jonathan of those who are registered. And I believe everyone that's here is registered. So I'll just go on from there. Um, since everybody that's here today was in class last semester, all I need to highlight for the syllabus is anything that's different. So what's different? Um, <laughs> what's different starts with it's a new a new concept coach registration and there's there's some slight differences in the page um so i, I know anna you had already done some concept coach for this semester but yeah. you'll have to start over oh it's okay <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you go to the concept coach site um there's a link if you like go to the um, Moodle webpage to take you directly to the class. Um, the class has an enrollment code of 101447. Since I'm not a student, just like with Power Campus registration here at Union, I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work for you. But if you have problems, let me know so I can understand and, and try to help. So registering for Concept Coach is a little different. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. And homework. You have to register again. They're, you know, physics 152 and 252. I don't have the option of having a year long class with concept coach, or not concept coach, expert TA. And so, depending on which class you're in, hey, Jonathan, um, grab the college physics. Um, depending on which class you're in, you will have the appropriate registration code on your syllabus for registering just like last semester. A reminder, when you start out, just go ahead and, well, you can unless you're confident. I mean, actually, at this point, you're probably all confident because you've already been through one semester. You can pay with credit card right at the outset, or you can take another free 14-day trial. If you take the 14-day trial, you can't pay until the 14-day trial ends, which means that you know, you'll have basically one day to get it paid, or you miss an assignment when that time comes. But just make sure we're clear on their process that you can't pay after you started the trial. You have to wait until it ends. Unless they updated it, which I don't think they did. Field trip. I can't guarantee this. We were told not to plan on it, but I think it's really important, so I do plan on it. Um, the Nebraska Academy of Sciences is an academic group for Nebraska that has their conference every year at Nebraska Wesleyan University, just down 48th Street, basically. And so on April 21, they have their meeting. We pay for your admission, which is only $15 each, not a big deal. And if you need transportation, we'll help facilitate that. And I'll give you a, a handout. You have to go and, you know, write a small summary of four different talks and of two posters. So that's something that's just a field trip we're going to take. The conference goes from 8 in the morning until like 4 in the afternoon or something like that. You can get everything you need done within two hours. It's best if you do it in the morning because that's when the poster sessions are, when you can actually talk to the poster presenters and get the value there. So something that's off in the future, but to make sure you understand about it. And then laboratory, we have, I think it's four or less laboratory experiments and one more lab project a group project so for lab this week we will have a normal lab for lab next week all you have to do for that lab is get your group of four people and get your topic that you're going to do your project on approved so if you do that beforehand you don't even have to show up that's so you have time to work on your own on the project and there'll be other lab periods throughout the semester where you just, we won't have an activity, it's time. So you can apportion your time wherever you want. But so I've taken away from the class time to give you time to work on your project. The projects need to be approved by me because some projects are too easy and some are too hard. And they need to be over a topic that's covered this semester. So this semester we're covering electricity, magnetism, um, optics, electromagnetic waves, quantum mechanics, uh, radioactive decay. So it needs to come from that realm of physics topics. 
So you can't do something like with trajectories because that's first semester. <clears throat> Otherwise, things are the same. Any questions? No, good. Let's move on. Oh, actually, I should point out another thing here. With your group project at the last class or lab period of this year, you're going to present a poster that you have made as well as an oral presentation. So there is a template for the poster on the Moodle page and there is, um, well, so you can use that to make your poster. The oral presentation, you need to have everybody involved. You can't say, okay, my group was Jonathan, Brandy, Gila and me, and only Jonathan's gonna talk, the rest are gonna sit down. Everybody has to be involved in the presentation. Okay, now any other questions? All right, here is the class schedule showing, you know, we're doing a lab on static electricity, which will be a unique lab tomorrow. And then we have the group project day, Ohm's Law, Kirchhoff's Law, exam one. Yeah. Group project day two, AC impedance, exam two, the human eye wave optics, and so on. And you can see over here, I even, I labeled the column concept coach, so you know. Those are what you need to do concept coaches for those days. Obviously, I'm not holding you responsible for doing 18, 1, 2, and 3 today. So 18, 1 through 6 are due on Wednesday for the concept coach. So that's your first assignment. Plus, there's a homework assignment already scheduled for, for Wednesday as well. So you can you know, get started on that as soon as you register for the class. <clears throat> All right. So let's get started with physics. <laughs> this is my highlights of what's different there. Discovery of electricity. Electricity is obviously ubiquitous, right? We have our electric lights, electric projector, electric computer, and so on. <clears throat> well, electricity wasn't always understood. And so what is our historical understanding? Notice as early as 600 BC, 600 years before Christ, it was known that some kind of charge could be accumulated by rubbing fur on amber. Now, fur on amber, I have a rubber rod to represent amber. I have what used to be a fleece, which is now not so much. And so by doing this, something funky could happen. And so let's see if I can actually make something funky happen. So here I have a pith ball. I always like to point out that is not whisking. And notice that it pulled it out to it. Right, it's definitely doing something without me touching it. Now that's some kind of spooky stuff. Remember last semester when we talked about gravity and something that Newton discovered was a force acting at a distance. But this is saying 600 BC, they realized that you could have some kind of charge and have this kind of force at a distance, something that is magical. In fact, if you look up the history of magnetism, there's a lot of magic involved with uh, the understanding of, of magnetism. Um, <clears throat> so people studied this, and one of the real breakthroughs came with great American physicist, Benjamin Franklin. So Benjamin Franklin took his amber, rubbed it with a rod, and he realized that you actually can get two different kinds of charge. You can, two different kinds you have to have names for. With mass, we only have one kind of charge, and so we just call it mass. But mass is actually a charge, it's a gravitational charge. With electric charge, it's two types. So it's bipolar, we say, bipolar, two poles. And so he said, well, let's just make one positive and one negative. And he said, I'm going to choose the charge that's on this amber rod is negative. And amber in Greek has the name electron. And it turns out that this rod has a bunch of extra electrons on it. And so it turns out that We call the thing that carries the negative charge the electron because it's what's on the amber. 
What's up, Jerry? Here, have a syllabus. Okay, good. We'll deal with it later. And so, got a mark, Jerry. Yeah, we'll deal with it later. <laughs> so let's let's look at some of the fun things we can do with electricity right off the bat. So I rubbed this up. I rubbed it a lot. I just played with that one pit ball. Let's take this thing here. This thing here is called an electroscope. What it is is a piece of metal with a little vein here that's weighted so it naturally hangs vertically. It's also made of metal. So I rub this up. I'm going to bring it up here. And then when I touch it, what's happening here while I'm touching it? Okay, the metal rod's moved away. When I took it away, what happened? It's still there. So in terms of force, what statements can you make about force with this? We have something that's pushing, repelling between this piece of metal and this piece of metal. There's a repulsive force. We can also say that I definitely transferred something when I touched that because it's still there. So I transferred something that made it repulsive. And so based on our Ben Franklin understanding, I transferred electrons. I had extra electrons on this. I brought it up and touched it, and the electrons moved. So now I have electrons on here. How can I get the electrons off of there? Touch it with what? No. My hand worked. Your body is kind of a, a sink for electron. In physics, when we say sink, we mean it can hold a lot. So you can add some, you can take them out, your body doesn't really care that much. And so that had extra electrons. I touched it. Since the electrons were being repelled, they were pushed on me. And my body just said, mm hmm. And so I gained some extra electrons. Question. So you kind of look at this fluid with the, you know, if you, it goes from a uh, high to low. He exactly looked at his fluid. I don't know if I have the words there, but he did, yeah, has the words there. And it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration? Um, not, not from a high concentration to a low concentration necessarily, but you had something, a fluid, something that's flowing, that's carrying the charge. <clears throat> and it wasn't until later that it was understood. Now, that's one kind of charge. Now, let's, let's do this again. Charge this up. I put it on here, move it around a little, get as much charge transfer as I can. Eh, not that great. Now I'm going to take this piece of glass and rub it on my shirt. We're pretending my shirt is made of silk, which it's not. It's uh, probably nylon, right? Okay, so when I bring this close, what happened to the repulsion? It went down. Now let's compare that to this. When I bring it close, what happens to the repulsion? It increased. It increased. There's a sign that we have two different kinds of charge because it had two different kinds of behavior. And so that leads us to there are two different types of charge. And so we have the negative charge for the electrons, and then we have positive charge. Now all of this you have practical experience with. I don't know about you guys. When I was in college, computers were young, right? And one of, one of my friends had a computer in his dorm room. And so they'd be sitting there playing games on the computer because what do you call us kids? They love their computers. And so we would come and we would rub our feet on the carpet and then come up and this game was like, it was a helicopter flying around. And you had radar warnings that would say, enemy behind, somebody behind you. So we come up and we say, enemy behind, touch our friends here. And you know, what happens then? Shock them. And they jump and they yell at us, and it's all funny and we laugh. <clears throat> Until you're the one that's playing the game and somebody does it to you. Well, what was going on there based on what we just talked about? Okay. When I rub my feet was the first step. We we call this a, well, it's tribal something or other. You'd think I would know better because that's what I studied when I was in Japan. <laughs> Tribology. 
Um, but when you rub two different types of materials, you have one material that has a stronger electron affinity and one that has a weaker electron affinity. And so you take the electron affinities of the two materials and you rub them, and you have electrons rub off of the one that has the lower affinity and off the one that has higher affinity. And so you develop a charge separation. Well, you don't make charge, right? You separate. You take from one surface to the other. So, for instance, when I was rubbing these rods, since I had a negative charge on the amber, what was happening to the fur? It's positive. So when I was, you know, rubbing the shoes on the carpet, I was building up a charge on me. It depends on the thing between my, the rubber of my soles and the, the nylon and the carpet, which charge I have, and I have to pay attention. But I slowly separate charge and building up more and more in my body. And then when I touch my friend, we have a large enough energy difference in the charge because of the charge buildup that we have electrons physically passing through the air, making the nice snap and everything, which we'll demonstrate here in a little bit. <clears throat> so you may have some good practical experience with this. One of our fundamental rules of physics, this is a fundamental rule, is that charge cannot be created or destroyed. We call this conservation of charge, hence the title at the top. So when I was walking around, I had charge transfer from one thing to the other, but it wasn't created, it wasn't destroyed. So that means that when I'm able to rub things and separate charges, there must have been charge on everything, and I'm just moving it around. So <clears throat> most things are electrically neutral. Now, you guys have already, has anyone here not taken general chemistry? Really? Excellent. I like it. <laughs> Most of us know that atoms have a positively charged nucleus. And you probably still know that without taking general chemistry in high school or whatever. Atoms have a positive charged nucleus. And if you don't know that, just look at the picture in the back. And then you have orbiting in some unknown way electrons. So the atoms have a positive nucleus and a negative cloud around them. And what is the natural state for an atom? Neutral. The natural state is neutral. So if you look back there at the periodic table, you say, oh, look, oxygen. Oxygen has the number, I can't even see, I can't remember. It has the number eight up in the right hand corner. It has that number eight in the right hand corner, that means it has eight protons in the nucleus. If it has eight protons in the nucleus and it's neutral, then it must have <coughs> electrons to counter. One of the very interesting things that's been discovered in science is that positive charge and negative charge are both what we call quantized. Quantized means they come in specific amounts. And the positive charge of a proton is exactly the same quantized amount as the negative charge of an electron, which works out real nicely. Because then if we have eight protons, positive charges in the nucleus, we put eight electrons around it and we'll be electrically neutral. And so that oxygen atom could be stripped of its eight electrons. So if you were to find an oxygen atom in the sun, and I know you can't go into the sun and go exploring for oxygen, but if you would, you would find the oxygen nucleus with no electrons because it's such a high kinetic energy that all the electrons have been torn away from it. And so it's completely ionized. We say all the electrons removed. Normally, they're neutral. And in the examples of the rubbing, I basically probably rub one electron off of a number of atoms. Probably didn't rub two off of any atom. So what is that fundamental unit of charge? 1.6021, okay, that's as far as I have memorized. I probably should memorize one, you know, because of rounding, one less digit. 1.602 or 1.6022 um, times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The C is for coulomb. That's Charles Coulomb's last name. Why Charles Coulomb? Because he studied the force due to electric charges. 
So the Coulomb, if you look at this, the charge of an electron being 1.6022 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs, a Coulomb is a really big charge compared to an electron. I mean, how many electrons do I need to get to one Coulomb? <laughs> I think you have two homework problems that basically ask this question in one way or another. How many electrons would I need to get to one Coulomb? A lot? Good answer, good answer. Well, I could just say the symbol we use for charge is Q. Capital Q or lowercase Q. Technically, capital Q means a stationary charge, and lowercase Q is a charge that can move. Nobody cares. We use them interchangeably. What is it not at this point? Not heat anymore. So Q is going to be equal to the number of electrons multiplied by the charge of an electron. So if I want Q is one Coulomb, then I just say number of electrons is equal to Q over charge of electron. So that's a very large number of electrons that I would need to reach one Coulomb. <clears throat> so when we're doing our problems, we're usually going to have units of things like micro Coulombs or nano Coulombs because a Coulomb is a really large amount of charge. Here are just some definitions for charges of elements. The charge of a proton, which we call E, is 1.60 plus 1.6022 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. The charge of an electron, which will be minus E, minus because electrons, according to Benjamin Franklin, have a negative charge, minus 1.6022 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs. Well, the other particle that is part of a, an atom is the neutron. The neutron's name, mute. Nuke means neutral. The on means particle. So neutrons are neutral particles. They have a charge of zero. Later on, we'll learn some really weird things. Like it turns out that quarks, the things that we believe protons and neutrons are made of, have charges of two-thirds or one-third electron charge. So here I've been saying the fundamental unit of charge is the charge of an electron. It turns out the quarks have a different charge. They have a fractional, one-third or two-third of that. But quarks are never found naked. They're always found in combinations, either two quarks or three quarks. And those combinations of quarks always have a charge that's an integer multiple of the charge of an electron. That'd be you know, plus, minus, one, two, or zero. So these are our common charges that we're going to work with. Notice the masses. The mass of an electron is far less. Like, what is that, 1 800th? the mass of a proton or a neutron. Protons and neutrons have roughly the same mass. I said 800, I don't know, I didn't do the math. It might be 8,000 for all I know. Johnson will tell me, right? I actually want to know now. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> the answer was, oh crap. Okay, let him finish, move on. A simple question or problem to get us going. We have a person walking across and unintentionally shocking the friend. What did you get? 1836. 1836? Okay. Two times 900. <laughs> um, and so let's suppose that the charge you get by rubbing your feet is about one nano coulomb. If the charge transferred by electrons, how many electrons is that going to be? What would my method be to find that? Yeah, okay, there's the number right there. About one two thousand. How many electrons would I have to have for one nano coulomb? What was the equation? Divided by the charge of an electron. So that'd be one nano. What is nano? 10 to the minus 9.
And since that's a one, it's going to be the same number as we got before. It's just going to be 10 to the nine smaller. So it's going to be 6.24 times 10 to the ninth. So not that hard. Now the second part, if your body has a, mat, a net charge of minus one nanocoulombs, estimate the percentage of excess electrons. Notice it says estimate. You're not doing an actual calculation. And in the hint, it tells us, let's assume that each atom has one proton per neutron. Is that true? If you look, look at the periodic table, it's reasonably true for atoms up through about... Um, <clears throat> Fluorine or neon, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, the the actual the graph on the left hand picture here, it, it actually kind of displays that. You start with the slope like this. This is the total number of things in the nucleus and the number, or excuse me, the number of protons and number of neutrons. And so it would be a straight line with a slope of one if that approximation is true. But you see that the line years away from it. The reason for that is actually real simple to understand because we saw already, um, Jordan pointed out, that we have a repulsive force between charges. One of the rules that we have for electric charges is that light charges repel. So if I have two protons together, they're pushing each other apart. So how do you hold the nucleus together if you have two protons pushing them apart? You went? No. Well, okay. Yes, kind of. I'm going I'm to say yes for that. It's You have to have something that's a glue holding them together. We have a total of four fundamental forces in physics. Gravitational force that we've studied to death. The electric force that we're going to be studying now. And then we have two more, the strong and weak nuclear forces. Those forces are not affected by electric charge because they're different forces. So they have a different charge. They have a color charge. Why a color charge? Because you have a tripolar instead of a bipolar. And so they had to come up with something that had three fundamental names. And they said, there are three fundamental colors. Red, green, and blue are the three primary colors of light. And so they call it color charge and say that the subatomic particles have colors, red, green, and blue. And you have attractive forces between those that we call color forces, the strong and weak nuclear forces. And protons and neutrons are held together by those forces. But protons are repel. So as you get more and more protons, the repulsion becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, one of the curious things is the strong and weak nuclear forces are very, very short range. So they only affect neighbors. So let me stand here. I would have a force between me and Brandy because we're neighbors. There would also be a force between Brandy and Jonathan because they're neighbors. And that would be attractive forces, something holding us together. But there's no force between Jonathan and me because we're too far apart for the nuclear forces. But the electromagnetic force is a longer range force. So if Jonathan and I are both positively charged, we're going to be pushing each other apart. And if Brandy is neutral, then there's no electromagnetic force between me and Brandy or between Jonathan and Brandy because she has zero charge. But we have the nuclear force that's holding each one of us to Brandy. And that nuclear force is strong enough that it would hold us together. But if we put more positive charge, if we brought Jordan over here, did another positive charge, then we have too much positive charge and we'd be pushed apart. But if we bring in Aaron, she could help to separate us and have more holding us together and less pushing apart. So as you get to bigger and bigger nuclei, you have more and more positive charge. You have to have more and more separation that includes the attraction. So you make the repulsive forces weaker by pushing them farther apart. And the attractive forces, you're having the next neighbor, so you're keeping those building up. That's why it's not one-to-one -one all the way. That was way off topic. <coughs> but hey, it's physics. So for order of magnitude here, you're going to assume that the number of charge, well, from the mass 
say your mass is made of protons and neutrons, so you just take your total mass divided by the mass of a proton, say that's how many protons plus neutrons, half of that's the number of protons, half of that then would also be the number of electrons you normally carry, and then you can calculate how much excess you have. It's kind of a complicated process, but it's not difficult, and we're not going to do it because we only have 20 minutes left. So why is Charles Coulomb famous? Because he developed this law. Now, notice that's a vector equation. We have minus r hat, 1, 2. What does it mean if I have the hat above the symbol? I heard somebody say unit. It's a unit vector. It's a vector of magnitude 1. All it's telling us is the direction. So that r12 is the direction from 1 to 2. The minus sign means it's going to be the opposite direction. And so all this thing here does is tells us direction. I have an easier way to tell direction. Opposites attract, likes repel. So when I use this calculation, I always simply choose to remove this part and use the magnitudes of the charge. So if the charge is positive or the charge is negative, I just use its magnitude. And so I write the equation as the magnitude of the force between charge 1 and 2 is equal to K times the magnitude of charge 1 times the magnitude of charge 2 divided by R12. R12 is the separation between the centers of the two charges squared. And so I calculate that magnitude. And then I use my innate intelligence to say, and if they're both the same sign, it's in the direction away. And if they're opposite signs, it's the direction toward each other. So I do the direction separate from the magnitude. It's just a lot easier to keep yourself straight that way. Now, notice with that force equation, does that look like anything else you've seen? What does it look like? It looks like the gravitational force. The electric force, the electrostatic force, is exactly the same form as the gravitational force. The gravitational force, <clears throat> that equation was developed by Newton through experimentation. This electric force was developed by Coulomb through similar experimentation. He took globes, touched them together, assumed charge is equally distributed, changed their separations, and measured how strong the force is. And he found that as you separate them, the force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance, and that the force is proportional to the product of the charges. So we can take this and compare it to the gravitational force, force of gravity magnitude, is equal to a constant instead of K, we use G. Charge 1, charge 2 over the separation squared. Notice the mass was the gravitational charge. Q is the electric charge. Gravitational charge only comes in one variety, positive. It's unipolar. Electric charge comes in two varieties, positive and negative. It's bipolar. But otherwise, what we've learned with gravity is exactly transferable to electric charge, which means that what we're learning right now is not some crazy hard to do thing. <clears throat> Polarization is an interesting topic. You guys know about polar <laughs> molecules, right? What does it mean for a molecule to be polar? It's like an Okay, it has an electric dipole moment. And do you know what that means? It means that there's a separation of positive and negative charge. There's a separation of the positive and negative charge. So let's look at a water molecule. Well, there's the water molecule. A water molecule, the picture on the left is a semi-realistic picture. It's semi-realistic. You know, what kind of bond do you form between the H and the O? It's a, oh, yes, it is. Not, it, that's not the one I was looking for, but it's a correct answer. It's a sigma bond. Is it ionic or covalent? That was ionic. 
So man, I got a couple months before I have to start teaching chemistry, so I'm good. I'll just learn. <laughs> um, so you have the electrons are shared. If you look at the outline of the picture over there on your left, the, the outline picture is the more realistic understanding that we have electrons filling in a region, but those electrons are more concentrated around the oxygen and less concentrated around the hydrogen because the hydrogen doesn't like its electron as much as oxygen likes electrons. And so because of that, we could treat in a simplified model each hydrogen as if it has basically a third of an electron missing. It's not a third truly missing, but the electron is being shared, because that's what covalent means, I'm going with you guys being right. The electron is being shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and it spends more of its time close to the oxygen and less of its time close to the hydrogen, giving the hydrogen a net average positive charge. And the electron then, or the oxygen then, has a net average negative charge, and so you can take this and say, well, it's kind of behaving as if I have something out here with a charge of plus 0.7 electron charges and something here with a charge of minus 0.7 electron charges. And so I can just calculate that electron dipole moment as that distance multiplied by the 0.7 E. And so we call this a polar molecule because it has the charge separation. And that polar molecule means that it does some cool things. Like what we saw when I brought the, both rods up to the pith, each one attracted the pith ball. The reason they each one attracted the pith ball is because the pith ball has polar molecules in it. And so if I bring something up that's negative, What's the negative charge going to do to the negative side of the polar molecules? It's going to repel them. What's going to do to the positive side? Attract them. So they're going to rotate so that the positive side is closer to my rod and the negative is farther. But then I have a force, same charges, but one's closer and one's farther. Which one's the stronger force? The one that's closer or the one that's farther? Closer. And so the attractive force is going to be stronger and it's going to pull it in. Now, when they actually touch, I can have then charge transfer, what we call conduction. So if I have them touch, I can have conduction, charge transfers over, and then be repelled. It depends on how much charge I transfer. So paper, that pith, same thing. Your hair, same thing. It doesn't matter if I have positive charge or negative charge. If I bring it up close to my hair, my hair is going to be attracted because I think it's because of the water molecules on the hair being polar molecules. <clears throat> that is, I'm, well, it's talking about the hydrogen bonds. I am not going to spend time on hydrogen bond other than here we have some important facts about hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds, which are actually what's responsible for DNA being held together. Uh, I believe they're also responsible for Van der Waals forces. They make water so that it's a liquid instead of a gas at room temperature really kind of beneficial to us, right? If it was a gas room temperature, we wouldn't be enjoying our baths, we wouldn't go swimming. Has a large specific heat, which means water acts as a heat sink. We can put a lot of heat into the water and barely raise the temperature. We can take a lot of heat out of the water and barely lowers the temperature. It has, and you can read these, large heat of vaporization. Um, it's uniqueness of being more dense as water, less dense as the ice. The large surface tension, all these things are because of the polar bonds. There's a picture showing the Van der Waals um, forces holding, or hydrogen bonds, excuse me, holding DNA together. Let's end this stuff and start with the playing and having fun. Now, in lab tomorrow, we're going to basically be playing and having fun. Well, some of you will. Depends on which group you're in. And I will randomly assign you. But this here is a tiny little Van de Graaff generator. <clears throat> and... It's basically a conveyor belt. And you'll study this, see it tomorrow, have time to play with it. But what it does is it's a conveyor belt that conveys electric charge up to the top. So when I plug this in, it's 
taking charge to the top. And you heard that arc, right? And right up here, draw some arcs off of there. Um, I'm going to turn off the lights because it's just more fun to have a light. <laughs> yeah, I don't like to get shocked, just for the record. Okay, so now we can see things nice and, yeah, the people's elbow. All right. Come up here. And, okay, how far would you estimate that arc was? How far away do you think I am from it? <laughs> right, that's somewhere like, let's say, five or six centimeters, and 30,000 volts per centimeter. So we're talking over 100,000 volts. Really high voltage. What is voltage? Voltage is the energy per charge. So higher voltage means the charge has more energy. You see here, these arcs are actually going from here down to here. What can we do with this? Well, we can do lots of fun things. Um, for one, I've been letting my hair grow, much to my wife's chagrin. She thinks bald men should not have longer hair. She's generally right, but it's not that long, right? I'm standing on this wood so I don't have arcs going from my feet into the ground because that really makes me unhappy. And it, makes, it allows charge to drain off of me. Now I'm going to put my hand on here. If I put my hand on here, this will stop shocking me. I don't like getting shocked. Okay. So now my body is starting to charge up. Um, since I started this, um, here, we turn the lights back on. <laughs> I don't want to go and get myself shocked again for no good reason. No, well, I guess those work too. Okay, so I can feel my hair is different. Can you see anything different? Yeah. What's my hair doing? Yeah. Why? My hair is, each piece of hair has the same type of charge on it. And so each hair is trying to repel all the other hairs, and so they get away. I can do things like this and, you know, mess up my hair. It's kind of cool, right? Now, are you combining the shots? Okay. Randy, come on up here, and you don't have to take my hands. Get close enough. Go to the side so people can actually see. Okay. Now, was that fun? No. <laughs> Did you see my hair when that happened? Why does it go down? Because the charge drained off of me on Grant. Do you mind staying here? Once you stand on here, it won't shock you. It's just okay. touching your hand. That's yeah. Now I asked. <laughs> I asked Brandy because she has thinner hair and longer hair. So if all goes well. Her hair should be more dramatic than mine. <laughs> um, don't push so hard. It's... <laughs> Come on. I, I see a little bit. Now, yeah, it's, it's starting to stick up a little bit. Depending on your shampoo and things like that, you can make it so it doesn't work as well. But if you look like on the back, there's a little bit just barely sticking out. Mm. It may not get so exciting. When you get yeah, when you get somebody like you're in the hair stamp and it's really cool. But yeah, it's it's probably not gonna be nice. Now, other things you can do that you should not do. You may very well have done this because your teacher may not have known you should do this. Have you seen where people make a change? So like I stand here and I put my hand on this and then I hold Brady's hand, she holds Aaron's hand, and she holds and so on. Don't do that. This is safe, but do you remember how much voltage I said it was? Over 100,000 volts. 100,000 volts should kill people, right? It doesn't kill us because this has a small conveyor belt conveying electricity. It has a small enough actual total charge that you can see my hair drop with the arc. Now, if we had a big chain, and then we touch somebody who would have all of that charge dumped at once, a lot more charge, and that becomes dangerous. So we don't do that. So what are fun things we can do with this? 
here's my favorite demonstration. I know I'm going to shock myself. Okay. My favorite demonstration here. I bought these pie tins. Paid my own good, hard-earned money for them. I put the pie tins on here. Next thing I'm going to do is plug it in, assuming that they stay balanced and don't fall off. What's going to happen? Shoot up. Upload. Yeah, I mean, this is science, so of course we have to just do it, right? I mean, we wouldn't come to physics class if we didn't have this kind of fun. Right, fun? Okay, they floated off, but one at a time. Why was it just one at a time? Why didn't they all go off at once? Because there's a ghost. It's because you couldn't see him. He was picking them off one at a time. Okay, so, not the ghost problem. But why was it one at a time? Okay, the electrons being charged in what? They were transferring from one place to the next, but then the last one Okay, that's that's partially correct. The electrons are being transferred, and actually the charge is going to distribute itself to be fairly uniform. That is, you'll have the same amount of charge on each plate. But it's not just electrostatic force that you have here. What's the other force involved? Gravity. So on the top plate, what's the net force of gravity on the top plate? Just go with weight of X number of plates. Weight of one plate. What about the second one? What's the net gravitational force for the second one? Weight of two, because it has one on top pushing down plus its own. And so you have each plate that's down below has more downward force because of the plates above. But the top one has the least downward force, hence that's the one that gets ejected each time. And as soon as that one's gone, then the one below has less downward force and it gets ejected. So it's a really cool demonstration to me about how charge is distributed. Now, since I have two minutes left, I'm going to finish up by talking about the difference between conductors and insulators. And I got to turn this back on now. <clears throat> conductors and insulators. The difference comes down to electron band structure of solids. And I'm guessing you don't care about that right now. We'll study it later on when we get to the solids. But for now, we'll suffice it to say that a conductor is a material where some electrons don't take any energy to make them move. And when I say don't, make, don't take any, that's an approximation. They take a little bit, but they take virtually no energy to make them move. An insulator, the electrons are held in place with their atoms. And you have to put in a fair amount of energy to take it out of its place and make it move. So insulated electrons are held in place. Conductor, the electrons are fairly free to move. And so if I have a conductor, if I put charge on it over here, that charge is just going to, you know, it's repelled by itself. So if I put two electrons here, one electron is going to try to get as far away from the other one as it can. Well, the fact is I'm not going to put one electron. I'm going to put a few billion electrons. And so those electrons are all going to move around to try to get as far away from each other as they can if it's a conductor because the electrons are pretty free to move. So for a conductor, which metals are conductors, so for this here, if I put charge here, it's going to spread over the entire thing. But for an insulator, my glass rod is an insulator, the electrons are pretty much stuck. They can't move. So if I bring something and put charge on here, I can put charge on here. I can also take away charge from here. But the charge can't move around. So if I put excess electrons right here, this point will be negatively charged, but over here won't be because the electrons are stuck there. So that's why when I did my rubbing here, Because we're all charged up from that thing, I, I am charged still and I can't drain this. <laughs> well, it's not to the demonstration because I can't even drain it. Um, when I touched it, I didn't just touch one part. I slid it back and forth and rotated 
so I can rub charge off of the insulator for more areas. Because the insulator, the charge is stuck on the surface, and I have to touch different parts of the surface to get that charge off. So that's the difference in an insulator and a conductor. What's a good insulator? Well, the best insulators are things like rubber, mica. What's a good conductor? Any metal is a good conductor, pretty much. And as I said, it has to do with the actual electron energies in the band structures. So it gets pretty complicated. Semiconductors are things that you have a very small amount of energy, but not approximately zero, required to make an electron move. So it doesn't take much energy, but it takes a little energy to make electrons move. That's what makes something a semiconductor. Okay, I'll see you in lab manana.